Hi, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Heather Denniston with the Junk You Should Know show again, Friday at noon, PST every week. And um, I am beyond ecstatic to have with me today, Dr. Michael Bruce, whose book I have just loved for a, a long time. I did an article on sleep a couple years ago. It came up then. It came up again for me in a class I was taking on brain health. And since then, I've been doing lots of research on him. And he was kind enough to join us today and share his expertise. And Dr. Bruce is a unique individual because not only is he a obviously board certified psychologist, but he is a fellow and a diplomate in two programs, which only 169 other humans on the planet hold. And he has also had the pleasure of joining people like Dr. Oz, Oprah, Katie Couric, CNN, all sorts of great talented um, shows where he has joined people and just talked about the subject of sleep and now the subject of when. And the power of when is the title of the book. We're going to talk about that today. But I want Dr. Bruce to just share a little bit more about his background and how you first got into sort of the sleep industry. And then you got into the when industry. And we're going to describe what that is in just a minute. But why don't you go ahead and share with us? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. This is awesome. I'm really I, lo I love the title of your group. And it sounds like you've got a lot of awesome information out there that to give to people. So that's fantastic. Thank you for having me for sure. Um, and you know, people always ask, you know, did you always grow up wanting to be a sleep doctor? I mean, <laughs> there weren't even sleep doctors when I was growing up. Um, or if there were, they were only in like academic centers and you know, that kind of thing. Um, and and the, so the answer is no. So I have a PhD in clinical psychology, um, but I'm also board certified in clinical sleep disorders. So I actually took the medical specialty board without going to medical school and oh, passed. Wow. Um, and that's why there's only like 160 something of us that have ever done that particular thing. There's actually a lot of sleep doctors, about five, 6,000 sleep doctors in the United States these days. Um, and it was interesting because when I was doing my residency, there was a rotation in the sleep lab. And I thought, that sounds cool. I'm, I, I sleep, you know, I, I, that sounds <laughs> to be, you know, interesting. I might as well just check it out. And literally, Heather, by the third day, I absolutely fell in love with clinical sleep medicine. And I knew that was where I wanted to be. You know, when you look at traditional psychology, uh, it can take weeks, months, even years before you see any type of treatment gains with your patients. You know, I help people that fast. Wow. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, uh, 24 to 48 hours, and I can usually be giving somebody some level of relief, whether it's for insomnia or apnea or narcolepsy or those types of things. Um, it's just, there's just, people don't get an opportunity really very often to meet a yeah. sleep doctor. Um, yeah. And then most people are only ever referred to a sleep doctor if there's a suspicion of sleep apnea. And so for folks yes. who may not know, sleep apnea is a situation where your throat literally collapses in the middle of the night and you stop breathing, right? So generally speaking, we like our patients to breathe, right? That's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good um, thing. It's a good thing. Hey, we don't uh, like it when you stop breathing at night. No, um, that is for sure. How many people suffer sleep issues just say in the United States, what's like the percent of people that have some kind of sleep complaint? Wow. Okay. So if we encompassed all of the sleep complaints out there, we could pretty much say almost everybody. Um, yeah. You're looking at probably north of 70, 75 percent of yeah. the population at any given time. You know, if you really drill down, we know that somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of people have sleep apnea. Um, roughly 30 percent of people at any given time have insomnia. Another 15% or so have restless leg syndrome. I mean, you just take those numbers right there, you're already at almost 60%. Yeah, right? that makes and that sense. doesn't include the people who've got like light, crappy sleep, you know, poor quality sleep that may not quite fit into a sleep disorder, but yeah. still they want to work on. Um, then then the bar gets even higher. So it's it's really pretty amazing to me anyway that sleep medicine as it is right now is really primarily just focused on apnea, narcolepsy. Yeah. Um, restless legs, that kind of stuff really doesn't go wet much into insomnia or quality sleep, which is really kind of my wheelhouse where I, where I spend a lot of my time. Yeah. And, and uh, you run into this every day, but patients who are like, oh, I sleep fine. And when you dig into it, they don't sleep fine at all. They sleep commonly, but they don't sleep normally. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, it, it is uh, first an education process and then a solution process. And that's what I have loved so much about the power of when your book is that it divides people into groups that make sense and then applies structure to say, here's how you solve those problems that you and all the other dolphins and bears and wolves and lions have. And so can you tell me, because 
We talk about chronotypes and we're gonna talk about that, but chronotypes is not a new thing, but you have taken it and developed it in such a way that it makes sense to the layperson and it can be practically applied. And so give us a little bit on history of chronotypes and then how you found your four part chronotype program. Sure, so it, it was kind of an interesting evolution. So I've been writing about chronotypes my entire career. Um, I, I've listed chronotypical uh, and circadian issues for people since my first book back in 2004. I've actually written over 80 different blogs just about chronotypes over the course of the last 10 years. So, so it's not a new area for me. It, but what was interesting was is my first book was really kind of a how to do it yourself, fix your sleep book. The second one was all about sleep and diet and how does sleep affect the metabolic system and why is that important? If you're trying to lose weight, why is it important to have good sleep? And then what I started to discover was that um, some of my patients um, really had some pretty atypical chronotypes. And so to give everybody the idea, what is a chronotype? So many yeah. people have heard the word before, but in fact, you, you do know what chronotypes are. If you've ever heard somebody called an early bird or a night owl, those are chronotypes, right? And so once you kind of think about that, then you say, okay, well, wh what else could there be? So back in the 70s, um, a, a group of people, Jim Horn was one of the big ones, they developed this scale called a morningness, eveningness scale, right? And that was kind of the first idea of early bird, night owl. Um, and then you go to like into the, like the mid 80s or so, and people said, well, there's got to be somebody in between. So they called that person a hummingbird, right? So we had early bird, we had hummingbird, we had night owl. And people thought it was kind of interesting, but they, they didn't really apply this conceptually um, at all, really. Um, people might take a test uh, if they're doing a shift work position and find out, okay, I'm a night owl, so shift work might be a good idea for me, as opposed to I'm an early bird, I probably shouldn't work on the night shift. We've seen some application there, but one of the things that I, I thought about is this is a genetically derived situation, right? So when you look at the genetics, it turns out that the period three gene in particular is uh, one, and the length of that gene determines sleep drive and circadian huh. consistency. And so once you kind of get that idea going, then you start to say, well, what other genetic factors that have to do with sleep could be out there? And of course, one is insomnia. And so what I contributed to the, to the vernacular and to the idea here is, yeah, you've got early birds. Yeah, you got people in the middle. Yeah, you got night owls. But what about insomniacs, the sleepless bird, if you will, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what I came up with. And so then I said, well, I'm a mammal right? I'm not a bird. Um, <laughs> and I don't relate to birds. So I'm going to choose mammals that actually have these similar cycles. So if you look at, so lions replace early birds because um, lions first kills before dawn. Um, that's kind of that, that eight, that typical creature. And by the way, early birds or what I call lions make up roughly 15% of the population. Okay. Um, they're my COOs. These are my kind of type A personalities. They like to make a list every day and go from step one to step two to step three. They get up very, very early, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning is not unusual for a lion. They could get up as late as six, um, yeah. but that would be sleeping in for some of the. <laughs> then uh, in the middle are bears. Uh, so bears are my solar sleepers. And, and in, in you know real life, bears wake up when the sun comes up. They go to sleep when the sun goes down, kind of in the middle type of yeah. thing. Um, Bears make up roughly 55% of the population. I mean, wow. one in two people is a bear. And I got to yeah. be honest with you, it's the best to be a bear. Yeah, um, and I'm a bear and I agree with you. And and um, and when I finally read that you said it's 55%, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, the, the lion, the dolphin, the wolf are kind of the outliers, but they have such a specific caricature. Almost all of us can go, oh, I know a dolphin or, uh, you know, whatever. So c continue. I want to hear more about this. So bears are kind of my extroverts. They're, um, they're the people that get stuff done. They're very gregarious, very friendly. They're the people who are, you know, buying drinks at the bar or having people to their home for dinner, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and they're very, very social creatures. And really the world works on a bear's schedule. Like yeah. working nine to five is perfect for a bear, but for yeah. a lion, it stinks, right? Because yeah. lions, they, you know, they're up at 4.30 in the morning. You know, they're ready to hit the, you know, hit work by 5.30, 6 o'clock, whereas, you know, the rest of the world is barely even getting up at that time. Um, the next are the night owls, what we call a wolf. Now, I am a wolf. Oh. I never go to bed before midnight, ever. Wow. 
It just, I haven't my whole life. It's just not something that I do. And it's kind of funny because my wife and I are both wolves and um, we didn't know it. So when we were dating, we've been married for 20 years. When we were dating, um, I'd say, what time do you want me to pick you up? She'd say eight o'clock. So, okay, I pick her up at eight. We go to dinner by, you know, 8.30. We get out of dinner by like quarter to 10. We might go to a movie at 10.30, get out at 12.30, then go for a dessert or a drink. We get back at two o'clock in the morning and we wouldn't think anything about it. Like we're both awake. It was fine. Whereas, you know, some people would be like, are you kidding me? That's yeah. Crazy. So I never realized that I was a wolf, but I, but I am. And, and wolves are very interesting from a personality perspective. Um, wolves have a tendency to be more introverted. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a tendency to be more creative. So these are my authors, my actors, my musicians. Um, people who are, are really good at creativity have a tendency to be wolves. Um, but there's a problem with being a wolf. Um, a lot of problems, actually. Wolves have a tendency to be the most sick. Um, they have a tendency to um, have the most depression. Um, and they have the tendency to have had a more difficult life, um, primarily because everybody thinks they're lazy. Yeah. Um, you know, they don't want to get out of bed at 8 o'clock. Like, for them, if, if they got out of bed every day at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, that would be perfect yeah. for them. They don't go to bed until 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And so... They don't work well in society schedule no. at all. They make up about 15% of the population. And I remember many times um, in college or out of college when I'd be sleeping all day Saturday, sleeping all day Sunday. And um, a lot of people were like, you're wasting the day. You're, yeah. you're missing out. And I'm like, dude, you don't get it. Like, <laughs> This is how I'm wired. Right, exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. Right. And I think your point, because uh, when I read the book, the wolf to me was the most sympathetic character uh, because uh, they fit least into society. It seems right. like uh, with that late night, uh, you even mentioned they have a tendency to the mental health problems, drug use, that sort of thing, um, yeah. because they're they're trying to make it work uh, in a bear's world. And um, it, it what a relief to to know, like, oh, I'm not this isn't just me. I'm I'm not wrong. It's yeah. how I'm genetically wired. So I love that. So what about the, um, so we've got bear wolf. Tell a little bit about the dolphin because my sister is a categorical dolphin. As soon as I read <laughs> that, I called her and I'm like, listen to this. <laughs> so tell me about the dolphin. So the dolphin is really who the book was written for. Um, and dolphins are my problem children. You know, dolphins are very much like lions. They're type A personalities. They make a list every day. Um, but dolphins have a fair amount of anxiety. Um, they usually have health issues. They are usually categorized themselves as insomniacs. Um, and um, they have just a little bit of OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so they, they, a project is never finished for a dolphin yeah. ever, you know, and they're always tweaking it and trying to make it just a little bit better, a little bit better. Whereas their boss is like, leave it alone. Like yeah. it's fine. Like get it in. And, and, so dolphins have a tendency to actually work better by themselves, not necessarily in groups so well. Um, and they have significant issues sleeping. And so getting them on a solid sleep schedule can actually be really important. And one thing that I should tell people about dolphins, well, two things. One is I chose dolphins particularly for a reason. Um, so it turns out that dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So only half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake looking for predators. And I thought that kind of represents somebody who's never quite asleep, right? And yes. so that's kind of why I use them. And then the other thing to remember about, about dolphins is um, it, they can sometimes um, go out of being a dolphin. So sometimes people have just got really crappy sleep, not necessarily genetically speaking, and they fall into that dolphin category. And then once we get them sleeping well, their true chronotype can come out. So I've had a lot of people who start out as a dolphin and then they say, well, I don't think that fits my, fits my personality, but it does fit my sleep schedule. And so I'm like, okay, so this is helpful. So here's what you need to do. We need to work on your sleep schedule get, and then we'll see your crew, true chronotype come out. I love that. And so we've got lions, bear, wolf, dolphin, and yeah. you are one genetically. Uh, right. Now, when I read the book, I resonated with a lot of lion traits. So mm -hmm. do people have sort of a base and then they can have traits of some of the others? Absolutely. And there are hybrids too, right? Okay. So like one of the things that I realized is within, like we've had almost a half a million people take the quiz now. And yeah. what we discovered was, is that there are early bears and there are late bears. Okay. Right. Because bears make up such a big percentage of the population. Yeah. 
that there had to be some type of, you know, subtype, some type of subtype or categories within that. And so we do know that there are early bears and late bears. And there appear to be some people that are hybrids. I mean, I definitely have people who are kind of like dolphin lion kind of combo platters sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's definitely frustrating for them, but we have different ways of working with them and kind of getting through it. And by the way, if you're ever really interested on the genetic side of it, um, if you go to 23andMe, um, yeah. you actually get a report on your morningness and your evening, which which correlates fairly well with what we're talking about here. Oh, that's, I have, I'll, I will go back to the website and check that out because um, I have done 23andMe and uh, that's great that you can do that. I did not know that. Uh, so that's, that's excellent. Now, do chronotypes change ever? You were in the book, you talk about how as when you're a baby, when you're a, you know, a teenager and stuff, they can oscillate a little bit, but typically once you're an adult, you're into your natural, is that how that works? Yeah, so roughly around age 20, you kind of settle into one chronotype. And we, okay. you know, look, anybody out there that's got a teenager, they're a wolf. Okay? Yeah. That's what teenagers do, right? Yeah. They sleep until two and they sleep until 12 because that's what they like to do. That's not their fault. That's biologically driven. Your circadian rhythm is shifting and moving around. But once you hit about 20 years old, it kind of locks and loads. Then things seem to change again around age 50 or so. Okay. So I just turned 50 this year. And um, and I'm actually starting to notice myself getting up earlier than I normally ever would have done before. Even though I'm still going to bed pretty late, I'm getting up earlier and earlier. So I'm feeling that shift myself uh, uh, quite a bit. But you know, as we get older, people have a tendency to move into one of two chronotypes: either become a lion, so an early morning person, or a dolphin because of medical complications and medications and things like that disrupting uh, disrupting their sleep. Yeah, that makes total sense. And we can see that in our senior population. They tend to get up early. They don't sleep well. They sleep for only a few hours a night. So right. that makes sense. But uh, the large portion of the population you're describing is between 20 and 50 or 60. And um, and that's where we really want to focus on the perfect day that you bring up in the book of once you know your chronotype, then comes that power of when that right. We can design a day based on our chronotype and be more productive, more happy, better relationships, so many things. So can you talk just briefly about the perfect day idea that you developed based on each of these mammal profiles? Yeah. So so once you figure out what your profile is, the big, big question is, well, Michael, who cares? Right. <laughs> like, OK, I'm a dolphin. OK, I'm a bear. That's fun for about 10 seconds. What, what do I do with that information? Right? Yeah. And so if you think about it. So let's take the extremes, right? Let's take a lion on one side and a wolf on the other. Remember lions, early people waking up at, you know, 4.35 o'clock, wanting to go to bed at eight versus uh, night people who don't want to wake up until 10, let's say, and go to bed at two, right? Yes. So when somebody wakes up at 6 a.m., okay, here's what happens from a hormonal perspective is melatonin turns off and cortisol and adrenaline turn on and a whole host of processes occur to start your day. For you to be able to get up, breathe, you know, all these different things that you have to do. There's a lot of neurotransmitters that are now at work once you're awake and started. That, that's a very predictable schedule, okay? Yeah. And almost all humans, it all happens roughly at the same time after they wake up. You hit these peaks and plateaus throughout the day, then you go to bed. But if you wake up at 5 a.m. versus 8 a.m., there's a big spread there, right? Yeah. Some people are ahead of you by three hours roughly. Yeah. That's where it gets really interesting. And so what I did was I looked into the medical literature and said, okay, we now know that there are certain hormones that we need to do just about anything. So sleep, eat, exercise, you know, uh, fall in love, ask your boss for a raise, whatever. And so those are on a very predictable pattern. So once I know what that predictable pattern is, I can then put that slot that in uh, under your chronotype. And all of a sudden it's like magic. It's crazy. Wow. People start doing stuff at different times. And all I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't do something. I'm just saying do whatever it is you want to do at a particular time and yeah. you will find that you're actually better at doing it. Well, I love that because you even talk about conversations with your, with your kids, when to have sex, when to call a friend, when to work out, when to eat. I mean, there there is hormone impact on all of those different activities. And if you choose correctly, then the outcome may be much better than it would have been originally. Absolutely. So. Yeah, which is so great. And so let's just take an example of fitness, um, being that that's sort of my wheelhouse, fitness and nutrition. And uh, so as far as chronotypes go, I'm a bear. When am I supposed to work out? So it depends, right? So 
Um, as an example, if you're if you're like I'm a runner, right? So okay. if you're a runner, right, then you, you first thing you have to decide is are you running for fat loss? Are you running for fitness? Or are you running for performance? Okay. Right? Those turn out to be three very different things. Right. So, if, so as an example, if you're a lion and you're running for fat loss, you're going to actually want to run fairly early in the morning on an empty stomach, not on a dehydrated stomach. Let's be very, very clear. I don't Excellent. want people out there not hydrated and running. And remember, sleep is a dehydrating process. Yes. People lose almost a full liter of water every night just through the humidity of their breath. Right. Yeah. So they might, they're going to want to work out early, early probably within 30 to 60 minutes of them waking up, right? Okay. But if you're a bear, you're not even up, you know, that's not for you. So then you would probably be working, you know, you might go for a run if you're trying to lose weight at eight. Whereas if you're a wolf and you don't get up until let's say 10, then you're not going to work. You see what I'm saying? Like, yes, stagger it like that. But let's that's say right. you run for performance, right? That's a little bit different, right? So running for performance, you're actually going to want to run later in the day closer to when race time would be, right? So if let's say you're doing a 5K on the weekend and the race starts at noon, then you want your body used to running at noon because then your body knows exactly what to do, energy expenditure, things like that will occur at, at that level. Again, letting your body know what's gonna yeah. be done. Yeah, so it, matters, it, yeah it matters so much more than we ever thought. So I'm yeah. sorry, I interrupted you. What were you gonna say there? No, 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 I was just saying that it's, it's really interesting. Um, and first of all, wolves hate to run. <laughs> um, so, opposite for me because I seem to like it. Wolves hate to exercise. Like we don't like to do any of that kind of thing ever. Um, but I found that it's just it's a great stress reliever for me and it's good for my health. So I, yeah. I'm in the gym almost every day and I'm running almost every day and I like it. Um, but wolves characteristically hate exercise. Then you could look at it not necessarily from a running perspective, but from an anaerobic perspective, right? So weightlifting. Right. Wow. So weightlifting has a very different rhythm because you don't, you don't want to weightlift early in the morning because it's great time to get injured. Right. Because wow. your muscles aren't warm. Your tendons aren't a little stretched out. And, and you know, a lot of weightlifters aren't stretching before they yeah. lift weights, but they should be. So yeah. you really want your body to have been up and around for about an hour and a half or two hours before you start hitting the gym really hard. Um, because then you can you can avoid injury. Also, from a performance standpoint, it's going to be different there as well because you need a different kind of energy. Don't get me wrong; it's all glucose. Yeah. But at yeah. the end of the day, you need explosive energy versus a regular cardio kind of clip, if you will, um, in terms of energy expenditure. So, it, it, and I'm not trying to make it too complicated here. No. The the good part here is in the book. Once you know your chronotype, you just yeah. go to that chapter, and and all of these chapters are super short. They're three pages. Um, yeah. And you say, I want to run or I want to practice yoga or I want to do a team sport or I want to do, you know, anaerobic exercise. What's my time? And you figure it yeah. out. I will tell you one caveat that I have learned about bears since you are a bear. Yes. Is even though you might perform better, for example, with weightlifting or running, if you did that a little bit later in the day, mm -hmm. if you're a bear and you don't exercise in the morning, you're probably not going to do it. Ah, good point. Oh, very, very true, sir. Yes, that's uh, that's very true. I've always said to both myself and my clients because I thought it was true for everyone is uh, you know, get it done at the beginning of the day because it's so much less likely to happen. But for us bears, uh, because we get you know we start to wind down, uh, sometimes it's it's just not going to happen. That's right. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think wolves don't rarely exercise is because they hate mornings. Yeah. And then once their day kind of kicks into gear, they're just playing catch up almost all day. Yeah. So it's really hard for them to get an opportunity to work out. Sorry, wolves. It's a, it's a, it's a tough designation, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But it's but the good news is there's lots of solutions in the book. And what yeah. I like is when you say I'm not trying to make it complicated, it's not complicated because once you see the wake up time that yep. is optimal, everything falls from there. Exactly. And so it's as simple as figure out your code, take the test on Dr. Bruce's website, and we'll show that website at the end. Take the test, once you know, you get a couple nice emails from him giving you a little bit more detail about your particular mammal, and yep. then um, and then get the book, because you know I, I first did the test, I got the information about the bear, but then I'm like, oh, I need to know more, because there is so much more detail in the book, and uh, and it's great. And like I said, I, I read from cover to cover because I could immediately identify a person in my life who was each of the other and it helped help me understand them better. So that was, that was super helpful. 
You know, it's um, the funniest thing, Heather, that I, I wasn't expecting when I wrote this book is it's turned out to be a communication tool um, more than anything. I, I, I thought I just found like this cool thing that I was going to teach everybody some cool science and, you know, maybe you'd be a little bit more optimal in what you do. But um, what I discovered was is this is a real communication tool. Like people, like I save marriages with this thing. Like it's yeah, I, and that is not an overstatement because you refer in the book, you talk about how you and your wife are both wolves and that wolves actually do well together when married and that wolves with another mammal uh, sometimes has a hard time. And if they can read about this and understand each other better, it absolutely makes sense that it would be a uh, incredibly great communication tool. So thank you for that. It's amazing when you put something out into the world and you have a limited expectation of it and, and the world uses it for something so much bigger than you ever anticipated. So congratulations on that. Yeah, That's it's great. been a lot of fun, and it's cer certainly been interesting um, to you know learn more about how people are sort of utilizing this this construct and 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 you know incorporating it into their lives. Yeah, absolutely, I love it. So, what's next for you, Doctor? You've got a pr you're in LA now. You've got a practice there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I'm just I've, I'm actually starting a practice here. I don't have one yet, but I'm starting a practice here. I've just been kind of crazy busy. Yeah. Um, we have a new supplement that's going to be coming out soon, so I'm excited about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I do a lot of interviews. I work with a lot of companies, and I do a lot of lectures, so it's fun. I mean, I really definitely enjoyed not so much lectures on the power of when, um, actually not really very many, but more on sleep stuff. So yeah. lately I've been doing more lectures on what I call sleep for peak performance. Ah. So we, we understand, like, so once we know your chronotype, then I can help develop an entire program for you. So I do a lot of work with like Fortune 100 CEOs and those kind of people to educate them on like, okay, dude, you know, you're in an airplane, you know, three days a week, you're not working out, you're eating steak every night, you know, yeah. and you're telling me you don't feel good. Well, I think there's a lot of things we can work on here. And so, yes. Oh, I think that's great. There's an incredible opportunity for kind of the uh, C-suite folks who are flying all over the world and uh, just asking way too much of their bodies. And the whole thing that you probably get this every time is the disrespect with which we pay the sleep process and yes. how we think we can control it and that we think uh, we can just do willy nilly with it and it's not gonna have an effect on our bodies, uh, which is s such a lie to ourselves. And I love that your work is out there kind of dispelling that myth. Well, you know, what's interesting is there's actually a part of our brain that tells us that we're not sleepy, the sleepier we get. Oh, interesting. Right? Kind so, of a counterintuitive thing. Yeah, well, I think what the theory at this point is that it's basically back from caveman days where, you know, if you were tired in the middle of the day and you decided to take a nap, you probably got eaten, you know, yeah. by the sword, <laughs> you know or something like that. Yeah. So it really didn't pay, um, you know, from an evolutionary perspective to be tired, you yeah. know? So I think that kicks in. And then what seems to happen is it's like, I'm not tired, I'm not tired, I'm not tired. And then all of a sudden, wham, you hit the wall and you are done. Yeah. You know, and that's really what we try to avoid. We don't like people getting to that point because it can be it can be dangerous, you know, especially if you're driving, Definitely. You know, you're kids in the car, that kind of thing. So we're really trying to get people to kind of preemptively understand what their sleep need is, you know. And yeah. let me tell you something, eight hours is a myth. OK, not everybody needs eight hours. I've been a yeah. six and a half hour sleeper. And I'm the sleep doctor, you know, yeah. for a very long period of time. Once you kind of figure out what your sleep need is, yes. just if you can get that consistently, you're going to be in much better shape. And I love that you individualize that because we are all humans with a varying array of chemistry happening inside our individual bodies and experiences and needs on our life. And so um, I think that's such a big part is the more we can kind of look at what we need personally and not just try to fit into a box. Uh, that's super helpful from a wellness and health perspective. Uh, quick quick question, um, chronotypes and feeding. So just a couple points on that. Is it time of day? Of, like one of the examples you use in the book is there's a dolphin and she carb loads on the front end of her day. And your advice to her was, uh, no, you need energy food, you need proteins and fats, and on the back end of your day is where you're gonna carb load to help sleep seduction. And right. uh, and so is that what it's kind of about is not only time of day, but makeup of, yeah, of well, what your meals are? definitely has a lot to do with it. We know that when people have a decent amount of carbs, it makes them sleepy, right? Yeah. Which is always so interesting to me because when you look at traditional breakfasts, cereal, muffins, bagels, like, it's just carb dense 
situation. Yeah. A lot of people are like, oh, well, I need my energy for the day. So here's yeah. what happens is when you when you ingest carbohydrates, it actually increases serotonin, mm -hmm. right? And so serotonin is the calming hormone. It makes you tired. It makes you sleepy. It makes you relaxed. That's why they call it comfort food, food. <laughs> right? Is because it makes you feel comfortable, right? Yeah. And so what I'm talking about with people, especially with dolphins who have a lot of nervous energy, we need to give them good food, good fats, um, you know, good proteins in the morning. Like, you know, uh, an egg white omelet with avocado is like yeah. a fantastic breakfast, you know, breakfast. Um, for people, you know, or sliced tomatoes or whatever you want to stick on there. But, you know, a bowl of Lucky Charms, while delicious, yeah. I will admit, <laughs> is probably not going to get you to the place you want to be yeah. because you're going to get that sugar crash. And then at 10 o'clock, you're going to be reaching for a candy bar, a cup of coffee yeah. or what have you. And. And that's, that doesn't work out too well. And, and for folks out there, there's also a weight loss rhythm that's important to kind of look at. There was a great study uh, looking at mice, and these were all genetically identical mice, right? So mouse A, mouse B, mouse C, are, there's nothing different about any of them. They're all genetically identical. Okay. The first trick cage, they were given a specific amount of food with a specific calorie, and they were given it 24 hours. They could have, It was available for them for 24 hours. The second one, same amount of food, exact same food. They were giving it to them for eight hours, uh, or no, 12 hours. And then the last one was for eight hours, okay? And here's what ended up happening is the free running one where you could eat whenever they wanted, gained weight. Same amount of food, same mm. caloric intake. The one at 12 hours maintained their weight and the one at eight hours lost weight. Wow. So it's pretty amazing. But if you can push the your food intake to a particular time frame, I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you eat because that's obviously not true. Yeah. You can get away with a little bit more cheating by yes. keeping it right into that area. And that's where I think we're seeing this big movement on intermittent fasting and looking yeah. at like kind of slowing down that constant caloric intake because yeah. honestly, our bodies really weren't designed to yeah. eat that way. Um, and the, just the availability of processed, gross, nasty stuff out there, it's just too easy to get that in. And then once that kind of gets into the system, it makes it all a big mess. Yeah, that's so true. I just was attending a lecture with Dr. Pam Peak on time-restricted feeding, and uh -huh. uh, she profiled a bunch of that work. And it's, uh, it is fascinating. I've always been a grazer. I've always been an advocate of, you know, eat every couple of hours. Uh, but boy, my mind is shifting on that. And uh, I have, was not aware of that study. It's very interesting. And it, and it does make sense. And I've seen it in clients who have employed time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting that um, just energetically, cognitively, weight-wise, things Things just seem to go better uh, when you're doing that. And we don't die because we waited an extra two hours to eat. Um, yeah. In fact, sometimes we do better. And, and even like you said, working out fasted but hydrated can have right. an incredible effect on weight loss. So, oh, yeah, sure. right? It's very powerful. So that's wonderful. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining and sharing your expertise with uh, the viewers for The Junk Show. And I'm just so, so appreciative of... Um, my being able to meet you actually. So thank you for that. And if you'll stay on just for a couple minutes, we'll sign off and I will make sure to put all the links below to your website and to the test and, and all of that, because it's really important that the viewers follow up on this great information and get their test done and figure out who are you, what mammal are you, and uh, what does that mean and, and continue on and learn more about that because we just function better in our lives when we do. So thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next Friday at noon PST on the Junkie Should Know show on the Well Fit and Fed Facebook page. And I look forward to continuing to share with you. And doctor, um, thank you so much. And we will definitely be in touch. Stand by. Thanks.